This is Deep Natter 13, and in this episode, Sean and I are continuing a previous discussion about finding our why around the things that we make. Sometimes it's easy to lose our way, and we end up needing to make a few tweaks or even a hard reset to get us back in the groove. Here we go. Yeah, I went to the comic book store today and uh, picked up a couple comics. There's a new... Um, there's a new book called Primordial uh-huh. that's uh, written by Jeff Lemire, who did Sweet Tooth, the, the Netflix show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he did another really great book that I'm reading right now called Gideon Falls. And the guy that, that his, his, his artist collaborator, Andrea Sorrentino, was also collaborating with him on this book. And it's, you know, it's this kind of Cold War, you know, conspiracy theory fiction uh, so right up my alley. I was going to say, he wrote that for you. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And then there's a there's another book that I got. I, I got an omnibus edition of the first six episodes or issues, rather, of this other comic called Department of Truth, which is the same kind of thing. It's, it's you know, Cold War conspiracy theories. So, Oh, that's cool. I, I, I love that you do that. Like a, a graphic novels, I don't, I've never really invested in them. But every time I go in those shops, like I'm in there for an hour because just like flicking through them as objects. Um, yeah, it's just it's just amazing. It's such a, a brilliant storytelling. I really wanted to get into the the Sandman stuff, which is obviously like the best mm-hmm. um, doing the graphic novel. Have you seen, by the way, that they're doing that on Audible with an incredible cast? I've heard it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I used to collect Sandman oh, comics, you? and yeah, and it wasn't. I mean, the story, yes, but I primarily collected them for the cover art, which was done by uh, Dave McKeon. Ah. And, well, who did all of the art, actually. But I loved the, 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 the pieces that he would create. In fact, I had, at one point, I had an, an entire collection that I sold for a lot. Because I had from Sandman 1 all the way up. And um, I don't know why I sold them, actually. I just, you know, it was one of those one of those decluttering periods where you're like, well, you know, I've, I've seen this, so I'm going to move on to something else. Certainly wasn't because I needed the money. Mm. I, I need to get into collecting stuff like that. I just, I just, uh, like it's the same way I feel about animation stuff. I just, I love the idea that there's nothing wrong with a live action film or anything like that, but I love it when like an entire movie is CGI or something, because you just know that they can dream up anything. It's, it's like, have you seen, um, the the Netflix series Love Death and Robots. Oh yes, fantastic! I mean, it's just and and everything is in a different style. Every time you you know new episodes, a completely different world, and and anything you can dream up, you can make. I love that kind of no holds barred. So we don't have to work out how to film this. The idea mm-hmm. that someone can sit down at a computer and come up with anything they can think of, and and put it into something, I think is is absolutely brilliant. I love it. I love the idea of of that. Same. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking about this with Adrian the other day. We're at a point right now where for anywhere from a few hundred dollars on the low end to a few thousand dollars on, you know, a little bit higher end, a mid, a mid tier, let's say, you can get the hardware and software that you need to create a film. Mm. That is just mind numbing to me. And, and, and to be able to do a film, and I'm, I'm talking about like a film with CG, a film, you know, editing software, CG software, titling software, um, inexpensive LED lighting, inexpensive cameras. I mean, there's never been, uh, I think, a better time to be an independent maker of visual media than there is right now. What was it? Um, is it Gareth Edwards, uh, the director, who I think, I think he was just, I think he's... The first feature I found him in was called Monsters. I think it was just called Monsters. And hmm. he he basically, it's a, it's a two-person cast, basically. It's just following this couple in a post-apocalyptic world where, where uh, monsters have taken over the planet and they're trying to make their way through around these huge gargantuan monsters. And he literally, he did his, all his own filming. He, he put this couple in a car and they drove from Mexico uh, up to, the, up to the, the U.S. border filming all the way then he got home and he sat down at his computer in his london his small london flat and did all the special effects himself 
And that movie wow. did really, really well. He then went on and was picked up to direct the first of the kind of reboots of the Godzilla series because of what he managed to do just himself. No kidding. You know, with a camera and these two people in a car. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd shoot like, he'd shoot scenes for B-roll that would, that would just be like the side of a road. And then in post-production, he changed the signs and, and put them as like quarantine signs instead of like, you know, El Paso, oh, wow. uh, many kilometers or whatever like that. He right, changed right, right, the right. signs and he'd add in like smoke in the background from a destroyed city. When you see the plate versus what he actually added to the plate afterwards and how he turned very ordinary shots and and the the brilliance of the film was actually the monsters are always these gargantuan things, but they're always in the background, and you're focusing on the love story between this couple who are trying to get to the border, basically. But just the fact I don't that he, think I've ever seen this movie. I'm sure it's called Monsters. I'm I'm gonna look it up. Oh right my gosh! Now. now I'm gonna have to look it up. It's it 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 was such a like as a as a as a film that's like, um, you know, done on such a low budget, so low tech. Yeah, 2010, uh, it's just called Monsters. And, okay, uh, yeah, I'll look it up. T- take a look at it because of, like, it's a technical achievement, just incredible, and done for, made for almost no money, like just so cheap compared to films that are made on big budgets today. And I don't think, unless you were told that, you wouldn't know that he just edited it in his bedroom, basically, and then became hmm. a director like of some note. Oh, so the other one you'll know of his is um, Rogue One, he did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. So Hollywood scooped him up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they, yeah. I think he's pretty attractive as somebody who's like, hang on a minute, we need you to do it within this budget. He's like, that's a lot of money. I could do it for a lot less. You know what I mean? He's, right, right. he's the guy they want. Yeah. Well, it's like Robert Rodriguez doing El Mariachi for $7,500. I mean, or, you know? or the, the Blair Witch guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that they mm-hmm. just, you, you come up with a simple idea that you can execute on for so little that can still stand shoulder to shoulder with stuff that's made for, for hundreds of times that amount. I, I just so respect people who can, who can work with minimalism. Okay, yeah. so this, this is actually something that's coming up for me now, actually, um, seeing as we're on this, is I, I've been rethinking my portrait work recently. Um, and I kind of I almost started second-guessing everything. Because I look at my portraits that I've worked really, really hard over the last sort of five years at least to get them looking as clean and simple and classical as possible. And I had a minute when I was looking around at things online the other day and uh, portrait work that other people were doing and kind of going, oh, yeah, but that's a cool trick or that's cool post-production or that's clever, you know, double exposure portraits or or lots of colored gels and strobes. And I felt myself getting pulled towards the gimmicks again. Really? Knowing, knowing that that kind of does better or draws more interest. And Wait, and but I, you're, you're the guy that's... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, the, you're the guy that, that, that has, has taught me about what an illusion all of that is. So what... And, and you know that to be true. So what is it that's pulling you back towards it? I don't know. I don't wow. know. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not being pulled back genuinely. I'm just being honest about the fact that the temptation is always there. Yeah. Um, to, to, to do something that I know impresses more and impresses the general, the, the general mm-hmm. pool of people who hang out online more. Um, it, I can't remember who, who'd posted, someone posted a portrait that I thought well, that's really cool because they just, I mean, they just done a very simple trick with, you know, taking two or three shots. Uh, one is a static portrait. The other was like a blur with a person moving forwards and another one was a blur moving back and they just comp them in together and sort of mess with the colors a bit. And it looked really cool. And I thought like, oh, maybe maybe I should do a series of portraits like that. And I'm like, no, I've done that. I've I've been through that phase of like playing with shutter speeds and gels and colors and whatever. And I just had to remind myself like that that – you know, there might be a project that comes up where that's what's called for, but there should be a reason for it, not just to get a bit more attention. And that actually I've, I've hopefully grown out of that stuff for the sake of it, for its own sake, that I've actually gone through and like tried to make my portraits as simple and classical as possible. But it's weird, isn't it? Like, like, because that's, I wanted to always be able to work out of a very small bag, you know, to be able mm-hmm, to shoot mm-hmm. a portrait anywhere I go with, with just a 50 mil, 
lens and maybe a little go 80 200 a godox light and a, and, a, and a modifier and be able to take that anywhere i go to shoot a very classical portrait on a white or a back, back, black background or against a textured surface or balance that with ambient light and I, I just caught myself going yeah but i could start adding stuff again um and had to remind myself that's not really what i'm what i'm about you know i, I, I know i get it i get truth. the temptation the ugly truth is because it's because that one portrait online was getting attention and i'm like yeah but i could do something i could get a bit more attention going for the portrait work that i'm doing that way and had to catch myself and go that's a that's a bad motive right you know is there something in there though about just not necessarily i mean maybe that's a symptom of something else maybe it's it's a symptom of wanting to do something different not necessarily leave simplicity and minimalism behind but do a body of work that is i i, I don't even know it, it's just it's that idea of chasing different rather than than chasing good like we have to chase something yeah so maybe there's something in there that 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 you know you're you're wanting to see and create something to to be different than the work that you're creating now and the first thing that catches your eye are those are those almost obvious tricks and crutches that photographers have a tendency to lean on yeah but what what i'm doing next is different in content and that's what i need to focus on but the but the way that i shoot yeah. it has to be classical and clean because that's what i believe in and every time i start going down that gimmicky road again I get I get excited about it for a bit and I do it and I throw it up online and people love it and then and then two months down the line I hate it again because I'm like what am I doing this is not this isn't this isn't saying anything better in fact it's confusing the message um and every time I go back to simple I'm happier that's just me personally I'm not suggesting that's that's what everyone should do but it's funny how quickly we can get ourselves off track if we start chasing the wrong thing um, like now I'm, I'm, you know, trying, I'm still trying to set up this, uh, this new project, um, started to meet local people who hopefully will be involved in it. And a few times when I'm sort of mapping this out, I've been tempted to start to complicate things for the sake of it. So sort of going, well, I should shoot this on film and I'm going like, but it won't, it won't be as good. I know. And I'm going to, what am I doing that for to, to, to bring in the hipsters? Why am I doing that? Is it because like everyone will go, Ooh, and gush over the grain in it? No, that's not why it doesn't add to the story that I'm trying to tell with these portraits. And then I'm going, well, maybe I could do something clever in Photoshop with these, with these photographs and, and fake an older look. I'm stop, stop doing that. Like why, why am I trying to gimmick this thing up to draw in attention? Why? And every time I strip it back and look at the mood board I created, I'm like, no, d d back yourself. You, in the, in, the, in the mood boards you put together, you are saying that you believe in, in just creating the cleanest, most uncluttered portraits that you possibly can. So it's the person in the image that does the talking, not a technique that you use that, that you think is fancy. And even if I'm going to use lighting in these, and I am, they're going to be environmental portraits. The inviting, the, the lighting must be so um, subtle that it must feel incredibly natural, and, and you're not noticing that it's that it's lit. So I'm trying right. to hide. You're, you're enhancing technique. what's already there more than creating something that's not there. Exactly, exactly. And so, so because I think the minute the it's funny, isn't it? Like so I think often we look at images. And sometimes we're drawn in because it's a cool technique or there's something cool about how they shot it. And then sometimes we're drawn to an image because it, it tells a good story or draws us to an interesting subject. And, and I want to be the latter photographer. And that's a completely subjective choice. And I respect the former. But every time I chase the former, I find myself unhappy. And when I, when I stick to my guns, keep things simple and chase the latter and try to get more substance in the work, I, I'm personally happier but i'm just being honest i had a, a moment of weakness this week <laughs> no i mean I, I i get it i mean i think i i don't remember if i told you or if i just thought about telling you I, i've i've listened to uh midnight miracle now probably half a dozen times oh yeah and and i'm trying to i'm trying to break down what it is that i like about it so much what it is that that i keep coming back to it for and and can i integrate some of that into what i do 
without it being um, contrived or, or an obvious just sort of ripoff of, of what they're doing. And I think if I so, sorry to, noticed... Sorry to cut you off. Do you, think, do you think we should just tell people what it is before you dive in? Oh, right, 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 right. Just really quickly, it's, it's Midnight Miracle is Dave Chappelle's new podcast, which is only available on Luminary, but you can download like a trial episode online if you look for it. So we both listen to that episode that's free to download multiple times. Um, and it's, it's obviously had an impact on you as, as a podcaster specifically. Massively. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, Mos Def is, is part of it. Uh, and Chris they Rock. weave in, say again, Chris Rock, Chris Rock. Yeah. yeah. And they weave in music. They weave in ambient audio. They weave in, you know, impromptu storytelling. It doesn't feel like it's scripted. And, and like, I'm, I'm going to start the trial this weekend and, and just blast, blast through them and, and listen to, you know, just sort of binge the whole mm season and see what it is about it because on 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 just on this first episode a couple things that they do number one they they do they do say the name of the show this is you know this is the midnight miracle or welcome to the midnight miracle or something to that effect but nobody okay <laughs> i i i don't even, i don't even know how to talk about it i'm so kind of excited and just inspired by it one of the things that they don't do is nobody introduces themselves yes nobody comes in and goes Hi, I'm Jeffrey Sidoris, and you're listening to Deep Matter. <laughs> Nobody does that. And I think that convention is a holdover from something long ago. Because it, with podcasts, there's no surprise. You don't go, oh, hold on a minute. This isn't what I meant to click on, you know, or this isn't the show I wanted to listen to. It's, you know what the show is. You know who the people are that are involved, right? So why do we still hold on to this strange, you know, introduction to something that it, it just seems redundant, I guess is the short version. Yeah. Or, or you could be Michael Rappaport and name your show 20 times in the first two minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Right. <laughs> just in case you were going to forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are so many things about the production of that show that I liked. There are so many things about, um, the format that I like where, where um, you know, uh, Chappelle tells uh, Mose that a friend of theirs has died and, and mm. Mose wasn't aware of it. And they, and just, and says this little, this, this quick prayer, and then they go into talking about it and they play some clips. And I mean, yes, I guess you have to plan some of that stuff, but the way it feels, mm. it feels much more spontaneous and it feels more, it feels like a richer conversation it feels like we as listeners happen to be walking through a studio where this conversation was taking place yeah i might be wrong but i i think from the things i've seen about that show is that they actually were just hanging out in a space for a period of time which makes me if that's true it makes me love it even more yeah i think so i think it really was just court conversations that they they poured drinks, sat around a table and talked, and then they captured all this stuff, and which actually makes it more impressive for people who are doing the post-production on that because they have to cut 100%. that together and make all that work and flow the way that it does. But I, I think it was as spontaneous as it sounds, at least to an extent. Which, like I said, it, 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 if that's true, and I'd like to do a little more research, it makes me love it even more because I, I think one of the things that I have, and I, and I, I will reluctantly admit this, I'm good at the conversation part. I'm good at the, at the back and forth. I'm good at creating space. I, you know, I, I, that stuff, I think I've, I've, I, there's still work to do in honing that and refining that. But I think I'm happy with that part of it. What I've been experimenting, and, and you have been really helpful and, and, and generous with your feedback on it, is kind of what they're doing with this show and with others like it. And that is integrating ambient audio or music loops or sound loops yeah. to build a richer experience than just the, the sort of tired convention of intro song, introduction, conversation with nothing under it, outro, outro music, end. Mm. So, so what I, are I your, want something more. Yeah. What are your takeaways? What are the things you'd like to kind of try out or roll in to, your, to what you do? I, th I think more of, and I, th I think it started with an episode with 
maybe with John Wilkening, where there were little audio beats, little audio cues to break up the conversation. And then it continued um, to evolve on, on a couple of other things that I don't really remember which ones they were, but using music more deliberately, instead of just an intro and an outro, there are these little almost sonic interstitials mm -hmm. that, that take us f between ideas. When an idea changes in the show or when a topic changes or when, when the direction of the conversation changes, just a little, a little something, whether it's a sound effect or a music cue or, or a piece of vintage radio or an ad or like mm -hmm. something like that to, to, to break it up and almost, almost serve it up as, as a chapter marker in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Where, where the listener gets an idea like, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're wrapping this and we're going to, we're going to go into this, this other area and we're taking a, a little turn here. Um, and I, I don't know what that looks like yet, but I, I feel like I'm approaching it not from the standpoint of to, to kind of go back to the beginning. I don't want it to feel like a, a gimmick. I want it to make sense. And I want it to serve the conversation and serve, you know, where I'm, where I'm trying to take the shows. And, and maybe that means something new entirely. Maybe that means something more narrative and less interviewee conversationally. I, I don't know yet, but I know that there's, I know I'm circling something mm -hmm. that's going to mark a change in, in what I'm able to produce. And I'm not going to leave the other stuff behind. I, I don't want to suggest that for a moment. I, I will continue to do PD. I will continue to do this show. I will, and, and maybe those shows evolve along with the whole. I don't know yet, but I feel mm -hmm. like I want to, I want to, and maybe even need to bring more to the shows that I do. And I don't know what that looks like just yet. I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, one time you did do that that I found very affecting was your first interview with Jack Lowe, um, which if people haven't listened to it, go back to, to PD. I'm, I'm not sure which episode it was, but it's worth a listen. And you included, Jack had recorded, because he, he, he does this, he captures audio wherever he goes. He's, that's part of how he documents the world. And he captured the kind of clap for carers thing that we were doing in this country on Thursday that's nights. That's right. That's right. And I remember where I was. This, it's one of those things I find audio can be incredibly powerful. And, mm -hmm. and when you hear a particular thing, um, it snaps you back to the place you first heard it. And it's, it's one of those for me. If I think about that, I know exactly where I was standing on Wandsworth Common, freezing my ass off on a winter day because I'd gone out to take photographs and I was about to turn around and go home. And you started talking about Jack recording people clapping for... Um, nurses and doctors in hospitals in the middle of the pandemic at like the height of the first wave when they were really, really struggling. And just listening to him talk about that and then you faded in, people clapping and banging pots on the street, like I found really, really moving. Like I had a, mm. I had a little moment in the, in the park there and that, mm. it really does. It adds to it because it's great that he talks about it. But when yeah. you take us there like that, you transport us there like that, I think it... It adds so many more layers. It's it's like in in Midnight Miracle when, um, they're talking about um, Amy Winehouse, and oh, um, yeah, wasn't her that, struggles. Oh my gosh, with addiction and you know the yeah. tragedy at the end of her life, and then they start pulling up a song of hers. You're like, oh gosh, yeah, it's, it's really really affecting and moving, hugely like powerful. Adding those layers, yeah. And that's I think what I'm talking about, but I don't want it to sound gratuitous. I don't want it to to become formulaic. Well, it can't, can it? Because if you can predict it, it doesn't work. It's got to mm -hmm. be, it's got, and I suppose that's the difficult thing is because if you're going to do it at all, you have to always do it. But are you going to have opportunities in every conversation to bring in extra elements like that? Because does it fit the conversation? It's quite a tricky thing to balance, I would imagine. I think it is. And, and so that leaves me wondering, you know, is, is, it, is it an evolution of an existing show or is it, is it, is it something new that I can do as, you know, a six or eight or 10 part episodic? So it does make sense because it's woven through every episode because that's the format of every episode. And I can kind of tailor, maybe tailor is the wrong word. I can, I can nudge the, the conversation or, or, or what the thing is in a direction to support those, those little cues, those little, um, 
um, flourishes, as it were? I don't know. I mean, the the ones that the podcasts that jump to mind like that are are those sort of serialized, like like Serial, for example, um, S Town, mm-hmm. um, recently Thirteen Minutes to the Moon. I'm not sure if you tried that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, BBC mm-hmm. produced series where Hans Zimmer actually did the music for a yeah. podcast, which is incredible. Um, cutting in not only music but also uh, interviews and then the original audio recordings from from the space shuttle and from Houston. Um, then, um, gosh, what's recently, oh, blackout, which I think I, I told you about the other yep, day. I just subscribed a, to that and I haven't, I haven't cool. listened yet, but I just subscribed yeah. to it. R- Rami Malek, uh, you know, including Foley as well. Like, like, like actually in the movies, they've obviously gone into a studio and recorded crunching boots on snow right. and stuff like that to, to put into it or, or, you know, gunshots or birds or, or a jet plane or whatever's happening in the actual episode. Like. There's a, it'd be amazing to see you try something like, have you ever, have you ever written anything that you could sort of flesh out or play with on that? I have an idea for something that I, that I told you about that, that, that sort of, Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's sort of, keep it a secret. Keep it a secret. Okay. <laughs> in, case, in case you do it, keep it a secret. Keep them, treat them mean, keep them keen. I, yeah. I think I that it. could be really interesting. Yes. And it's That'd be great. I'm becoming more and more fascinated with the idea of, of a narrative show and and you and I both know so many people who have such interesting mannerisms and accents and and who live in interesting parts of the world and that the tech is in in such a place that we could record look at me I'm I'm roping you in we because you know I'm I'm just I'm I'm assuming you're going to help me with this um I'm ready to go I'm ready to go we could record people anywhere and then add in city ambience, traffic noise, whatever it is. I mean, almost the equivalent of audio green screening. Record a clean audio, yeah, you know, plate, and then bring in these other elements. And I think it would be a fun experiment if, if, if for nothing else other than to to hear the thing in the world and and see whether I could pull it off. I think that would be really interesting. I think it'd be amazing. I mean, you've got to give it a shot. I mean, you've got such a reverence for audio. Yeah. Um, and, and all, right back to old radio, you mm-hmm. know, I think, I think just, and you write really well, I think actually writing this and recording it, even just for yourself to experiment with it and see how it goes would be incredible. And the nice thing about these, I mean, you, if you take the kind of British sitcom approach, if you just do six episodes or something, you, you make it tight and you make it limited run. Right. And this is what it is. And just let it be that. And you know, if it if it if it does well and you want to do more, you can, but like set your initial target at something reasonable and just crack them out all at once. It could be really, really cool. I, I like I'm I like the idea of that a lot. Um and I'm thinking about more and more of the kinds of things that I do as s- specific or definitive uh issues or episodes rather than trying to think about something as an ongoing, okay, I'm just going to do this thing and just keep doing this thing and don't really know when or where or if it will end. I do like the idea of, of having sort of arc-driven projects to work on. There's a, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end, and then you move on to the next thing. And, and if you want to revisit that thing, you build in the flexibility to do it. But I, I, I feel like it then... It then gives people, um, it allows them to manage expectations on what they're in for, if that makes sense. Yeah, and also helps you sort of put a start and an end to something so it feels complete because otherwise it's, it's just never ending, isn't right. it? Like, I, I really love the idea of people who put out photography books, which they shot in, in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to pull that off one day where I can just go somewhere and photograph something. And, and that is the entire project start to finish. There was a start point and there was an end point and it was clear like that. That I think is quite attractive as well. Otherwise, I don't know. It just sort of, it, it ends up never, never, it never ceases to pressure you to keep, to keep going or keep revising or updating or, or treading water with it. I, I like a, I like a, a start and a finish. Yeah, I do too. As well. Do you give yourself a chance or, or the opportunity to just go play or are, when you're, when you're out making something, is it always potentially in service of something greater or can, can it just be for its own sake? 
Oh no, yeah. I mean, I've, I I do yeah. play quite a bit. I mean, I've I've uh, I've just got this new um, camera. Rico have sent me this GR three X, which is a it's like a point and shoot with a fixed forty mil equivalent lens on it. So I've been doing lots of little tests to work out what can this thing do. I'm not really showing many of them because they're crap, but it's it's fun to try something with a new tool and see mm-hmm. what it can pull off. So, um, you know, taking photographs of mannequin heads in my garage just because like, okay, well, let's let's see what this could do. I mean, it's not a photograph, but it's but it's just fun. It's fun to do. And then then that gives me ideas for things. And um and yeah, I mean there's there's lots of stages uh, of experimentation that happen long before I actually finish something that I'd be happy to print and put on a wall that are all fun. In fact, sometimes they're more fun because by the time you get to that final piece, it's so well prepared and planned. It's lost that early experimentation and creativity that's often quite fun. Um, so I, I, can, I can feel like, for example, this um, this portrait project that I'm trying to get off the ground now, that... I, you know that that at the moment it's a struggle because I haven't taken a single photograph for the project. I've taken lots of photographs or experiments to try uh, different looks for this project when I actually started, and I've done a lot of running around and talking to people and trying to meet people and and get access, which is obviously the most difficult thing when you're doing something that's portrait and documentary. And I, I caught myself the other day getting a bit frustrated with all of it and how slow it's moving. And then I remembered that every other time I've done this sort of thing, I look back at those early days and miss them by the time I'm a year into something. Mm. You lose a little flexibility, don't you? Yeah, and it becomes formulaic. It's mm-hmm. like what you were saying. You don't want to add elements to a podcast that then become formulaic. It has to stay creativity. It has to stay experimentation and discovery every time. Um, and you have to you have to stay... Um, open to to new things and 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 taking risks, and I think I think the further things go on, uh, it, like my YouTube channel is a good example, I guess. Like I I know the videos where I where I tried something new and experimented and it felt good, and then I know the ones where I just sat on my couch and and, and spat out a formula because I know it works. I know which one I prefer for myself to make. When I'm making it, I'm scared and it's. And it's difficult and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with things and it takes me three times as long. Um, when I do the formulaic stuff, it's like, well, that was quick. I can just hammer it out and throw it up online. But every time I look back, I prefer the ones I struggled hmm. in, in, in retrospect. Mm-hmm. And I look back at the formulaic ones, even if they did well, quote unquote, online numbers wise, I'm like, yeah, but that's just a throwaway thing. So it's almost like, I mean, what did we, we had this conversation early on, didn't we? Does, does effort um does it add to what we make and i reckon especially when it comes to to the amount of courage we have to apply to something to make it how much we're willing to risk and how much we're willing to experiment um we'll always look back on that stuff fonder than the stuff that we do that's formulaic and i think the trick is for longer term projects what i'm realizing is if i start experimenting now I need to make sure that if I'm still doing this project two years from now, that I'm still trying to push the boat out and it's not just becoming a formula because I think the minute it does, it's time to close it down. Um, because what am I doing anymore? Uh, it's time to, it's time to have a new challenge. Yeah. See that lands with me. It makes me think about the things that I'm doing now and not that I haven't been anyway, but, but it really does make me want to take a longer look at what I'm doing now and go, is it time to wipe the slate clean and start again? Is it, is it time to just, and, and not from the standpoint of I'm going to burn it all down, but has, has what I do the way I do it run its course or have, have I just, do I just need to turn a little bit of a corner? Is it, is it a kaleidoscope or is it a reset? You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, for for my two cents, for you, I would I would say two things. One is is people you you have a core audience that really find a great deal of value in what you do. Um, and if I equate that to me, it would be like the YouTube channel that I run that might be frustrating at times and feel formulaic, but I know it adds value to people, so I'll keep doing that. And the experimentation gets mm-hmm. done over and above that my my need to keep giving myself challenges and to keep being brave and experimenting 
isn't the temptation isn't there to 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 kill everything else that I'm doing and wipe the slate clean. It's to make sure that I'm still pushing myself in everything else that I do and within the things that I do. I don't feel the need to burn it all down. Um, and I reckon, I reckon, I reckon it's what you're talking about. Like, you know, maybe, maybe it has run its course for you. I'm not saying it hasn't. And and that's really a personal question. I guess you have to answer for yourself. Um, I'd be sad to see anything that you do right now go personally, but it's not up to me. Um, yeah. And maybe, I I mean, I don't think it will. No, but it's also, I I think if anything, I need to add to it. I think I need to give myself room to to have an experimental outlet that that isn't anything yet and just keep trying slightly different things to see what feels right and what feels um honest and what resonates with an audience yeah and i think the only the only time you have to burn everything to the ground is if you don't have the space to try that extra thing which yeah. we, which we probably both have that space to try the extra things so it's, yes. it's, it's great to do it that way first and keep the good things that we're doing going. And yeah, definitely to cut out the fat. If there's, if there's stuff we're doing that doesn't need to be there, that's just us treading water and it can go, that's great. Keep the good stuff going and then, and then carve out intentional space to, to risk and try new things. Yeah. And I, I, mean, I, think, I think to a degree I've, I've started doing that, you know, both both on the front end and on the back end, I've, I've been sort of paring things down and, and, you know, combining things together Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, tightening everything up. And I think subconsciously all of that is in preparation for making more room for something else that's coming that I haven't really wrapped my head around just yet. Yeah. And it's not that you don't have ideas. I mean, I know this narrative idea, which you've hinted at today, uh, the blue collar project, which you've talked about in previous episodes, like you've got ideas and any one of those I think would be incredibly fulfilling for you. Um, it's just a case of, you know, when the world is in the right place and, uh, when you can get these things going, I think that'll, those will be the things where, um, you just find extra fulfillment in what you do. Right. It's, it's not to take away. And I know you know this, but it's not to take away from what you do now because, you, you, I caught you on a rare moment admitting that you're good at what you do earlier. And I don't want to lose that. Like, this is like, you really, <laughs> no, I didn't. that wasn't me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I got it recorded. Um, you, <laughs> like you really are one of the best I know of what you do talking to artists. And I mean, I've told you like since being up here, friends that I've met here and got onto your podcasts, and I've got artist friends up here who now listen every single episode, every single week, because they are, they 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 find your very natural empathy and interest in people really compelling. And it what's what is is what makes you a good interviewer. And I know you think everyone is like that, or or, or just it's a natural thing. It's really really not. It's a super rare thing, from from my experience. And it, it, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd hate to see you, not that there's any danger of that I'm sure, but I'd hate to see you, um, stop giving the world that. And I, I think it satisfies you as well from when I've spoken to you. I think when you come off a great interview with somebody like you're fired up, like it's, oh, it's what you, it's what you love to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I contrast that with, I, I made the mistake of starting to watch fake famous, the documentary that oh, we talked you- about. Yeah. What's it like? <laughs> oh, Jesus, Sean. I got about 15 minutes into it and I was oh. so angry that I had to turn it off. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that's enough. Maybe, maybe you get the point. <laughs> you entitled bunch of, you know, like I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I deserve it. One, one, one girl said, I just want to, I just want a, a, a job where I can lay around the pool. And I'm like, oh, well, gosh. good luck. Yeah. Ugh. Oh man. And she'll probably get it. Probably she'll, she'll probably get it until she's 35 and then, and then she'll disappear oh, just, into anonymity. I'm trying to figure out ways that I can go deeper. I'm trying to figure out ways that I can connect more authentically, more honestly. And then I watch this thing and you know, why do you want to be famous? <laughs> because I deserve it. <laughs> because I deserve it. Do you? Okay. Yeah. They, they oh, said in that, in that doc that the, the pink wall at, at the Paul Smith location in Southern California is the number one tourist destination in California. 
more than the Hollywood sign, more than the Chinese theater, more than Griffith Observatory, like more than Venice Beach. People come to that pink wall and take selfies because they've seen their influencer heroes on that pink wall taking selfies. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's just a bit vapid, isn't it? Yeah. It's and then they said, uh, and it made me giggle because you and I talked about your, your uh, uh, trip to the schools that you did, uh, where YouTuber was number four or five. Mm, um, number four, yeah. Number four. Influencer, YouTube influencer, number one career choice among adolescents. That is terrifying. Yeah. Well, I mean, the good news is I'm, I'm pretty sure the bubble is bursting. So uh, it won't be that way for long. Um, and I think it'll be a very weird patch in history that we look back on. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, I, I can't, you know, I have a hard time blaming people because I, I get it. I understand it. It looks like an amazing life. Who wouldn't want to, you know, be in a, a, a villa in you know, God knows where, or, you know, on the beach in Bali and every once in a while you have to lift, lift up this branded water bottle and like, who wouldn't want that? I get it. I get the allure, but at the end yeah, of the know, day, you know the, you know, the jet's not real, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a piece of fiberglass they brought in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but it, it isn't real. That's the other thing. I think, I think you do look at this stuff and you think like, and, and that's, they work incredibly hard to make their lives look that glossy, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's really not follow, follow them around with a documentary crew. And I, I'm, it looks like from the trailer, that's what that documentary is setting out to prove is actually it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much like the rest of our lives behind the scenes. And most of them don't last very long. It doesn't, right. it's, it's not a, it's not a trick that works for long. Um, I mean, for a very, very tiny select few, we're talking a fraction of a percent it works in the long run and they make big money and all the rest of it. But the rest just run around, I think, making a bit of a fool of themselves and then, and then get disillusioned and move away. And look, you know, it, give it a shot if you think it's important and, and, and you think it can work out for you. But I mean, this is why I said to these school uh, guidance counselors, you better have a backup plan. You better have an actual uh, career with that, that are following actual interests that you have because the chances of this working out for you yeah, especially in the long run, because I think even some people who it does work out for, they get disillusioned and want to walk away. Right. It's, it's, it's not a real thing. It's not built off. It's not built off uh, genuine interests you have. It's just a naked rush at fame and fortune that you're going to, you're going to realize when you get to the end of that road, that there's not a lot of meaning there and you're going to want the meaning right. and then right. you're going to have to change direction and change course. There's a, there's a terrific Bastille lyric that goes, we want the bodies on the billboards, not the lives underneath them. Oof. But I mean, you know, for, for us, it's, it's, it's not that alluring. And when it does crop up, like it did for me this week going, I wonder if I could change my portrait so they get more attention. Like that, that ugly thought popped in my head, at least, I hopefully by now have the self-awareness to at least keep myself on track. I have a little wobble and then I remind myself, no, there's more, there's more important things. And I think that's the best we can do is call ourselves on it. You know, there's no point in pointing the fingers at the kids and playing, get off. Absolutely. Um, it's just a case of, of being hard on myself because I only have myself to blame if I start chasing things. I mean, we, we both know, for example, people who, um, have been on YouTube and still are, but, but the content they used to content, the stuff they used to <laughs> the make C -word. was, I don't know, I know <laughs> the, the stuff they used to make, you and I both loved and found it incredibly deep and meaningful. But over the years they've been seduced by, by the dark side and views and they've, they're, they're playing to the crowd. Now there's a tragedy in that. And that's, I think, because they they're not hard enough on themselves about, about, keeping the meaning in what they're doing. Um, and yes, they might be making a bit more money, but how much money do you need? And, and what's really, what's really important to you? I mean, I just, what, what, what do you really want? What do you really want? I think that's the question. That is going to do it for this episode. If you're enjoying these, please subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything in your favorite podcast app to get episodes of Deep Natter along with Process Driven and everything else I release all in one feed. 
You can help others find the show by leaving a review or a rating wherever you listen or by sharing it on social media. If you'd like to connect with Sean, you can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Tuck. That's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K. Or on his website, seantucker.photography, or by searching for Sean Tucker on YouTube. You can connect with me at Jeffrey Sedoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. And that'll work on Twitter or Instagram. You can also visit my website at jeffreysedoris.com. And as always, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for listening. We appreciate your time. And we hope you'll come back for the next one. Thank you.